Hey guys, Mr. Backer here. This is part one of lesson 2.6. We're going to prove some theorems using geometric properties. A proof is a logical argument that shows that a statement is true, and we're going to be using two column proofs a lot like we did with solving equations, where we've got numbered statements and corresponding reasons, and we're going to be proving things called theorems. A theorem is just a statement that can be proven true. In this first example, we're taking a look at this diagram. We're given that angle 1 is congruent to angle 3, and we want to prove that angle EBA is congruent to angle DBC. Just like we did with our equation proofs, we always want to start with our given information. So in this one, we're given that angle 1 is congruent to angle 3. And our reason there is just going to be given because that was the information that was told to us. In statement number two, I'm going to start building up towards these bigger angles. If we look, EBA is made up of angle three and angle two, and DBC is made up of angle one and angle two. So what I'm going to do with this statement is I'm going to add on angle two on both sides. So we get the statement that says angle one plus angle two is congruent to angle three plus angle two. And that's our addition property. Now in step number three, I want to look more closely at this angle one plus angle two. If we added those things together, angle one plus angle two, we should get that bigger angle DBC. And that's using our angle addition postulate. We can also do something similar with this angle three and angle two. If we look, those two angles make up the big angle EBA. So we get the statement that says angle three plus angle two equals angle EBA. And again, that's using our angle addition postulate. Now in our last step, we're gonna be doing some substitution. Earlier, we had angle one plus angle two, and we just said that angle one plus angle two is the same as angle DBC. So we're going to replace that in that equation or use the substitution property there. So we can replace the angle one plus angle two with angle DBC. We can also do something similar with this angle three plus angle two. This stuff we just got done saying was equal to angle EBA. So we can replace angle three plus angle two with angle EBA. And both of those things we're using our substitution property. And then we're done. We wanted to prove that angle EBA was congruent to angle DBC. That's what we just said in our last statement. So we're done with this proof. In this next example, we've got this line segment to take a look at. We're told that the length of AC is equal to AB plus AB. And what we want to go through and prove is that the length of AB is equal to the length of BC. Just like we started our last proof, we always want to start off with that given information. So we've got AC is equal to AB plus AB, and our reason there is just given. Now we somehow need to get BC involved in this proof, and I guess what I'm looking at is there's another way that we could write out the segments that make up AC. And I'm thinking let's use our segment addition postulate. We could say that AC is made up of the small piece AB and BC. And like I mentioned, that's our segment addition postulate. Now if we look, earlier we said AC was equal to AB plus AB, and now we just said that AC is equal to AB plus BC. So I'm gonna do some substitution. I'm gonna take this AC up here and replace it with AB plus BC. So we get the statement that says AB plus BC equals AB plus AB. And again, that was using our substitution property. Now, if we look at our equation, we've got AB on one side and BC on the other side. We've got extra copies of AB that we don't need in there. So we can use our subtraction property to get rid of those things. We're going to subtract AB from both sides. So then we end up with a statement that says BC equals AB. And again, we were using our subtraction property. And then we're done. We wanted to show that the length of AB was equal to the length of BC. And that's what our last statement says. So we're all done with this proof. 
The last thing I want to mention are some properties of congruence. We've got the reflexive property, the symmetric property, and the transitive property. The way the reflexive property works is it says whether we've got an angle or a segment or some sort of geometric figure, it is going to be congruent to itself. So in this example, we've got angle A being congruent to angle A. It has to be the same size as itself. For the symmetric property, if A is congruent to B, then the symmetric property says we can flip that statement around. Then angle B is congruent to angle A. And our transitive property, we've got three different angles for this example. If A is congruent to B, and B is congruent to C, then A has to be congruent to angle C. Last example, we're looking at which property is being shown by the statements. So A says if angle R is congruent to angle T, and angle T is congruent to angle P, then angle R is congruent to angle P. So we're thinking about those properties of congruence that we just talked about on the last slide. And this one is going to be our transitive property. We've got angle R being congruent to angle T, and then we say that T is congruent to P, so R has to be congruent to P based on that transitive property. In letter B, it says segment NK is congruent to segment BD. Then it says that segment BD is congruent to segment NK. So again, we're trying to figure out what property this is, and this is our symmetric property. Our symmetric property lets us flip the order of that congruence statement around. That's going to be it for this video. Thanks for watching.